kind of said, Dad's having a bit of technical difficulty this morning, so we'll um, move right into the, the world trade matrix and sort of what's changing on that from uh, this last WASD report and some insights on that. I should have cut, you should have already received a copy of both this PowerPoint and a, uh, a corrected uh, PDF file. In the PDF file, I printed it with page notes. There's a lot of information underneath in the page notes, which in the interest of time, I may not uh, touch base on uh, directly, but I thought it was important enough information to highlight it in the notes anyway. So I always like to touch base on the macro issues that we're looking at. Um, a lot of these issues haven't changed, but uh, they've sort of I've rearranged them in the order of significance. One thing that concerns me greatly is the, I guess, the residual impacts of this COVID-19. The ag sector particularly has adjusted to it fairly well. But look, we're looking at global recession, uh, fairly significant, uh, which I think the U.S. in some regards won't be impacted with that quite as much as a lot of other countries, which are going to be significantly impacted. That's going to uh, affect consumption. We're seeing a shift in demand patterns, and we're still trying to get our heads around the impact on that. Another key thing I touch base on is currency. The U.S. has seen a bit of weakness in recent weeks, and that's actually helping the competitiveness of our exports. Uh, I, longer term, I've got to be quite bullish for the U.S. dollar for a number of reasons, particularly with the global recession issue. So that's going to keep our dollar relatively strong, and all in all, it's going to make our exports a, a, a bit more difficult to compete into it to a lot of a lot of markets on that. Um, moving moving on, I think I'll skip this slide. Just going to start out with price today. We have seen a modest recovery in the price of corn. We've seen Chicago corn increase in value ten to twelve cents. Um, which is in response to uh, stabilization in demand. We see, see that, that coming back. I also think it's important to look at the wheat situation, particularly when we get to talking about Europe. Uh, corn is going to increasingly price itself into the feed ration, particularly in Europe, and wheat's pricing itself out as it, as it should. Uh, this is the WTI crude oil. We spoke a bit last time about ethanol, but look, we've seen a very V-shaped sharp recovery in the oil price. The Russians and the uh, Saudis have agreed to extend their production cuts, I believe for another six months, maybe until December. So that's a good signal. That's put profitability back into the ethanol sector. <clears throat> Interesting thing on world FOB, these are FOB to FOB price comparisons. Notice that purple line at the top is black sea corn, but they've got very tight stocks coming to the end of this season. They're rationing demand with those higher prices until we get to the new crop situation. In contrast, look down at the uh, Argentine prices, which are very much discounted. Uh, what we're seeing down there, one particularly is harvest pressure, which is, which is a seasonal thing. If we look back to uh, earlier in that, that graph, we see uh, seasonally Argentina becomes quite discounted, but they've also got some logistical issues down, the, down there as well. U.S. and Brazil are pretty much in line where they should be to, uh, to be competitive. Looking at the fundamentals and highlighting a few things, uh, these, this is the changes in, in, in coarse grains production. I always like to look at the coarse grains complex, even though corn dominates it. We're seeing a significant increase in production around the world, not just in the U.S., but U.S. particularly. Uh, rebounding from last year, but also to, a, to I think, a record record corn production. Uh, Dan will expand on, on that a bit more. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in production of sorghum, oats, and rye. We're seeing a uh, bit of a decline in barley. And I want to spend a bit of a, a moment, if I can, towards the end, talking about the barley situation. There's some things happening there related to uh, Australia, which I think are important. Also, in the wake of that, we're seeing also a jump in world consumption of grain. One, it's, it's cheap. Two, continues to be driven by the demand for animal protein. Even with the drop in uh, ethanol and fuel production, we're seeing good demand coming out of, uh, of the animal sector around the world as people want to eat and continue to eat, eat well on that, which is, uh, which is good to see. And that's across... Um, across all the complexes. 
with the exception of maybe barley, we're seeing a bit of, bit of, of, of a drop in that. <coughs> World coarse grain trades. This is looking at the uh, uh, international trade, which is what we're focusing on in, in Grains Council particularly. Um, what we, what we, um, sorry, I, oh, where's my page up? <clears throat> Continuing to see growth in global, global trade, even with bigger production around the world and particularly in corn. With the big corn supply, uh, we're gonna see increased trade, which means as an organization, we need to be fairly, uh, fairly focused on the, those competitive markets and, and what we're, where we're looking to, to ship that. This is a list of uh, the changes in trade. Uh, I've included in here both May and June uh, changes, and I've updated the, the May numbers to, to June. The big shifts we've seen in China on uh, sorghum, and you gotta continue to be optimistic on the, the sorghum trade into China, uh, particularly in the wake of what they've done to the Australians on their slapping an 80% tariff on their barley imports. But uh, that sorghum, interesting thing, just a comment, uh, in China, Baijiu, that grain alcohol, they actually sell that product as a health food. And uh, I can't help but think uh, a number of Chinese are probably consuming more Baijiu as a, as a uh, health medication or treatment for the, the coronavirus situation. Look, that's pure speculation on my part, but it, but it does, does make a good story. Looking on down the line, we're going to talk about uh, Europe here in a minute and their uh, uh, changes in corn. Uh, particularly on on exports as well as well as imports, and um, and then Mexico continue to see that really be driven by by the livestock sector down there. <clears throat> okay, as I mentioned, uh, trade imports into China are expected to grow. Um, question is, will U.S. Con continue to compete in that market, or will they will it come from alternative sources, uh, South America, uh, Europe, or, or even Australia, as they, particularly in the sorghum type situation. Um, touch base on the barley situation. Australia is recovering from a three year drought situation. So they're gonna go back to more average production. This year, they're gonna produce about 10.5 million tons of barley. They'll export probably well, A Bear said earlier this week it was going to be about 4.5 million tons, but I think it's going to be somewhere between five and a half to maybe even seven million tons of barley. China slapped an 80% tariff on that, so two thirds of their barley tends to go to China, but uh, that's not going to happen this year. I reckon it'll be less than a million tons, if that. So they're going to be aggressively seeking other markets, and uh, we should be cognizant on trying to, to compete with that. <clears throat> EU uh, trade and, and use um, imports are going to, to are at a record 21.5 million tons this year. They're going to increase uh, to 23 million tons next year. That's being driven by one, the animal uh, sector, but also a lot of it's going to be substituted and replaced wheat in the ration given the wheat corn spread and the demand for, uh, for quality wheat. So that's, that's quite optimistic on, on that front. And I think we need to have a good, uh, continue to have a good look at our European customers over there and, and target those guys quite aggressively. Moving on to exports. Um, Europe also exports about four and a half to million tons of corn this year, which is, uh, a record export of EU corn. Uh, next year, it should be about status quo. The one thing I want to point out on the exports of European corn is look where their corn is going to. Uh, Turkey, Egypt, uh, uh, Mediterranean, and, and North Africa, those are sort of expected markets, but it stood out for me as South Korea. 11% uh, of their corn exports go to South Korea. That should be a highly contestable market where U.S. corn should really go in there more competitively than, than European. And strategically, I think we need to think about how do we, uh, how do we take that on and make uh, U.S. corn more preferable into that uh, South Korea market. 
<clears throat> these are the changes year to year on the exporters. Uh, we see Argentina down, dry weather, more competition uh, for both corn and, and barley. We're seeing Australia, the barley exports being up 1.3, 1, 1 and I think it'll actually be higher than that, closer to 2, 2.5 million metric tons, which is key. Brazilian corn uh, exports uh, continue to grow. And then dropping down to the bottom, uh, we see UK, UK corn and uh, US corn increasing. The US number to an increase of uh, 8 million metric tons, uh, record exportable supplies this particular season. So as, uh, as an organization, you know, we need to help the market find homes for, for, this, for this grain. Um, world trade situation, the only one I really wanna highlight in here is this Australia, China, anti-dumping duties which was slapped on it was about a what was it a 70 73.6 percent uh duty and then uh another 6.9 percent for a 80.5 percent import duty on australia barley going into china china imports both feed and malt barley but probably 80 percent of australia malt barley goes goes into to China. So we're seeing a significant drop in barley imports. One, because of the feed situation in there. And I think that's what's lending support to China, sorghum purchasing as well. But uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see Australia barley try to find itself into some places where particularly Canadian barley tends to, tends to go. Um, just to highlight on this, um, the focus on Australia a bit. Just in full disclosure and disclaimer, I, I do have a farm in Australia. I am a barley producer as well of a, as a wheat and a canola producer from time to time. So this is sort of near and dear to my heart a bit. They expect to produce about 10 and a half million metric tons of, uh, of barley. And the tray, as I said early, uh, USDA says they'll export about four and a half. I think it'll be closer to five and a half to, to seven, seven million tons on that. Uh, we're seeing a significant rebound on their production. This is a list of the competing countries. We have seen growing demand for barley in Thailand. Not a lot from 200,000 tons to about 400, half a million metric tons, but I'm not quite sure where that demand is coming from. In there. Um, I'll leave the rest of that there for you guys to have a look at. I'm assuming is Dan, Dan online. I might, uh, turn this over to Dan to talk about the uh, WASD report, and then we'll answer questions. Is Dan online? I don't. Hey. So, God, Dan is, is still working on on getting access. He's uh, he's had to switch through through a couple different computers. So, if if you um, if we want, we can go ahead and open it up to some questions um, that people may have. Another few questions in the chat. Uh, I know one specifically from Anna about some of the numbers that you use. Um, this is on the world trade import numbers. In the case of Colombia, it says that corn consumption will grow on next marketing year while the poultry industry in Colombia is actually expecting a decrease of around 10 or 15 percent. She was wondering if uh, those numbers were part of the WASTU report. Yeah, yeah. Look, where, where, was, where was that, that comment? Sorry. That's on the, is that on the import matrix? To find where that was. Hi, hi. It's on the yeah the import trade numbers, trade import numbers that we have. I think it was like the fifth uh, slide, maybe. Yeah. Um, import trade numbers. See if I can find that. Uh, and that was the Columbia numbers. But the numbers yeah. I put in here were right out of the WASD uh, okay, May, May or June. Um, the world trade on um, the world trade changes to May and June. 
that, those were mainly the June situation. Um, I don't see Columbia on that. On the, um, I can't find the import one. Um, yeah, look, those were right out of the out of the USDA numbers. And look, I USDA doesn't right. always get them right. So, are you suggesting that those uh, numbers are too high? Well, I'm just wondering because why are they increasing when the industry is actually expecting? Like, Colombia has been really hit hard by this pandemic, and consumption, chicken consumption, has suffered. So, and it said they had like a note that the poultry industry was the one growing. So, I do. I was just wondering. So you think that's? Um, I think that yeah, it look, I, doesn't I, exactly I reflect the reality, but that's why I was asking if it was part of the report. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not. Look, that's part of the report, and look, I appreciate you pointing that out. Uh, so you'd actually suggest I think this year's number was it's showing what at six point two million. They've got it projected for six point five million next year with a three hundred thousand ton increase, and they're actually suggesting growing feed used by the poultry sector, but you're suggesting that it's, that it's probably off a bit. I think so, yeah. Yeah, all right, that's that's good to know. I hadn't I hadn't picked that picked that up, but that's good, good to know. Um, all right, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions on that? Looks like Dan's getting close to being on. <clears throat> Yes, uh, this is Dan O'Brien. Any semblance of me being calm, cool, and collected is purely coincidental, okay? <laughs> so, um, uh, so Kyle, do you have my presentation? Uh, I think I'd sent it to you guys earlier. Yeah, from this computer that I'm on, suddenly I'm getting kind of a weird orange screen. That's what I'm seeing. Are you seeing anything different? It all looks good here, Dan. So oh, can if you go ahead and put it into full screen use and go forward, okay. I think we'll be right. Okay, so when, what you're seeing, the U.S. Grains Council side of it and all that, that my introductory slide? Yep. Oh, good. Okay. Just because I can't see it doesn't mean it's not a bad thing. So uh, are you seeing a split screen or a full screen? We're, screen? we're seeing a split screen. Okay. Now that ought to help, right? There you yes. go. Okay, well... Um, thanks for your patience. Uh, uh, I could, I could talk about uh, computer issues, but you've all been there too. So let's, let's go on. So uh, Guy, in terms of what you've talked about, you've spoken about international trends. Is that correct? Yeah. I just talked about the international trade matrix is all. Okay. Well, I, I can talk about, uh, uh, results of yesterday's WASDA report and current crop conditions as, as they relate to your interests. Again, corn, sorghum have a little bit also on barley and oats uh, being in the feed grain realm. So let's go ahead and move on. Um, uh, for, look at corn markets first. Of course, the, we had this uh, supply demand uh, uh, report yesterday. The, the big thing we're looking at is corn supply demand. <clears throat> and uh, there was a, a, uh, a complimentary USDA report that that basically talked about uh, it was cleaning up uncertainty and questions about about uh, some northern states. Uh, by the time it was all said and done, uh, the USDA made us made a uh, forty-five million dollar <laughs> million dollar forty-five million bushel excuse me uh, reduction in production uh, for the 2019 crop, and uh, you know I I'm, I'm glad they cleaned that up the fear coming into all of that was that, gosh, you know, when we were in the middle of all that, with all that delayed harvest, it could have been 200 to 400 million bushels. But by the time it's all said and done, it ends up being uh, 45 million with earlier reductions, uh, uh, you know, arguably not that big of a deal. <clears throat> they also came in and uh, again, the 2019 marketing year, 2019-20, lasts until August 31st and uh, we they ended up in this report and shaved off another 50 million uh, bushels of use for ethanol and, and again uh, that that number could have been a whole lot more I, we were looking at five five plus billion bushels initially five five uh, two five three I think 
<clears throat> so by the time they've, they've uh, added this reduction on top of others, you know, they're down about, I, I think about three, 300, 300, 350 million bushels uh, on usage and uh, down to 4.9. And, and uh, we, we were considering, uh, you know, in the worst of that, a, a month ago, given that the economy had closed travel-wise, you know, was that going to be 4 billion bushels? So anyway, uh, the losses in corn usage have been somewhat mitigated. And uh, so, so really, uh, I think the thing to keep in mind is that when we look at, uh, at this balance sheet and for when you're talking to your people, uh, to your potential customers about, about uh, what supplies there, there will be for corn in the coming year, it's kind of a, a, a two, uh, well, it's, it's a classic Kansas economist on, on the one hand and then on the other. On the one hand, here the USDA has projected uh, some numbers in for 2020 that, that, are, that are subject to change. Uh, the planted acres number uh, been long questioned, uh, uh, long as in several months anyway, ever since the prospective planning re plannings report in March. Uh, we'll have at the end of this month, uh, uh, is it 30th or 31st, I think it's 30th, uh, a new acreage report and, and the, the dead, dead bullseye aim will be on that top number on, on the 2000, 2021 uh, uh, balance sheet, 97 million acres. Uh, you'll see some numbers later where, where, where I come in and say about, it's about 95.5, something like that. But that, uh, again, uh, far, far more, well, quite a bit more than what we feared could happen out of all this uh, at, at 92, 93, 94. So 97 right now is their number. And, and uh, they also have, you see a yield uh, figure there, 178.5. Um, that would be record high by about... Uh, more than one bushel, closer to two two bushels per acre. Um, so already uh, on the, on the one, and you see by the time you go through that 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 there's a projection with 90, 97 million acres planted, 178.5 um, bushels per acre. Uh, that they've got almost 16 billion bushels of corn projected. So um, uh, take a one and a half. A million acres off of that, uh, off of uh, plantings, and uh, uh, down to say 95, 96, somewhere like that. Look at something more like 175, 176. Well, and, and use a typical harvested about 91 percent harvested the planted acres, 90, 91. Uh, plug in uh, 176 bushels per acre, 175. You've got something closer to to um, closer to probably four. Closer to 15 billion bushels, you could it, it could be 14 and a half to 15. Regardless, you know, still a whole bunch of corn uh, near the top end of what we've ever produced. Uh, I think fifth, near 15 a couple of years ago was that was the high, <clears throat> and and uh, um, you know I, I know when you're talking with customers, uh, you're uh, you're wondering about scarcity of supply right now. Really absent a drought. Uh, there's not much in the way of having more than adequate supplies of corn at, at relatively low prices. Uh, this marketing year, you know, we're not thinking this is anything, any great shakes. Look down stocks to use ratio. Well, the ending stocks figure uh, for this market, for the current marketing year we're in, uh, 1920, 2.1 billion uh, projections with a near 16 billion bushel crop over 22, uh, 22, 23 percent stocks to use, uh, 3.3 billion ending, ending stocks. And really, if, if there's a surprise there, it's that, is that uh, with that highest stocks to use, you, you know, uh, there, there'd sure be at least seasonal risk coming into harvest of being at, at prices of 320 or below that. And that's the season average price, harvest lows probably near $3 or below. If, if we really got all of this, uh, you know, a 16 billion bushel corn crop. It's more, if it's more like 14 and a half, then you then uh, then you're you're closer probably to the somewhere between three and 350, three fifty, three three sixty thereabouts again. So, um, uh, I, our friends in the USDA 
do the best job they can. They, they, and what they put out moves the market. That's just the way it is or sets the stage for the market. Right now, this, what you see here for this 2021 projection coming out of yesterday's report with a few minor adjustments uh, is a you know, large crop, low price scenario, and, and really at times lower than what you see there. Um, you know, and a lot of what I'll say for corn kind of builds off of that. Do you have any, Kyle, any questions anybody has uh, on that? If not, we'll keep going then. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. Get this in advancing. There we go. Uh, and so you can see how it, how it works out in terms of stocks to use. Um, uh, to give us perspective, uh, again, the real, if, if you're a producer, the glory time price-wise was back in 2012, 2013, and, Eth ethanol was uh, still going strong. The big expansion in ethanol, of course, came in 2006 into 7, 8, 9. We've been pretty much level since then. And that, uh, we were tightening up supplies coming into 11, 12, 12, 13, and drought hit. And, you know, tremendous, tremendous corn prices have come down since then and haven't had a major drought to, to, change, to change much of that. And so you see, uh, uh, where we're at now, uh, for this market here, put 85% uh, uh, likelihood on that. Uh, again, uh, stronger demand, uh, production problems could come in and affect all that here as we go on. And then look, looking into next year, uh, it's, if, if you're just artistic in how you look at charts and, and, see, and you notice, well, man, 22.5%, a lot higher <laughs> than anything we've seen of late. And with that high of a jump, uh, you wonder is the 320 actually low enough to represent where that where that market's going? Uh, so uh, that's kind of the overall picture. Just to show you a few other things here, there was this report that that the USDA had done. It's kind of a catch-up report. They explained their process of how they came to all of that. Uh, the, so USDA NAS gave some updated numbers for corn, and you can see their. Uh, Part of this broader sample with, of, of what they had done is tied in with who all they sampled for their for what NAS sampled it there in June, and uh, here, here are the the numbers. I I wouldn't say it's much ado about nothing at all. I, I mean I would not say that, but there there weren't any big surprises in this. Uh, again, you can see harvested acres down a little bit, yield down a little bit uh, in the overall U.S. You can see the states as they were affected. Um, Largely, this is a North Dakota story, is what this is. Large and South Dakota, of course, had hand in it, but but uh, uh, the, the pictures we saw of combine still in the field uh, a month ago, most of them came out of North Dakota. Uh, and and there's a stocks report. Uh, what what um, here at the end of uh, end of June. Uh, We'll also have a, there'll be a stocks report to go along with the, the acreage report. And uh, as a setup to that, uh, there were these back adjustments made in the DEES corn stocks. So now these numbers that we had now will come right into this end of the month stocks report. And it'll be, a, it, you know, we're, they've already, quote, made their adjustments. And, and again, in essence, they're, they're, uh, they've scaled things down a little bit to reflect about 46 million less bushels in the U.S. <clears throat> and really, maybe your uh, probably probably the, the thing that uh, that would be of, int of value to you would be yes, what this report said, but what's what's happening with the crop? And you can see here now, uh, for the most part, uh, look at that that June 7th uh, column, about the fourth one over in terms of corn planted. Uh, here in the U.S., to relative to average, and it really doesn't look like in any place there's a problem except when you go to North Dakota, they're 87 percent planted as opposed to 96. You know, really well respected uh, 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 ag journalist Karen Braun came out with a headline about two weeks ago and said North Dakota is abandoning corn. Like, well, yeah, <laughs> some, but not completely. Uh, still. Corn, corn mainly being planted, but on the on the fringe, on the on the edge, uh, 
you see this. Now, a thing that I note, uh, while in Kansas we're going great guns, worried about drought, my colleagues in, in, uh, I, in Illinois and Ohio are, uh, are talking about preventive planting problems. So there's some, there's kind of this sneaky deal going on uh, to where th there are some pretty wet acres that, that uh, are showing up. And, and I, when I look at these numbers, they really don't, to me, they don't show up. But, but yet they're having information meetings on, on, on this year's version of preventive planting. So <clears throat> I don't know that the market has paid that much attention to that yet. Uh, you know, the June 1 date coming up for crop insurance, all, all that had to place. So that, that's kind of another inhibitor on where the market could go. Crop conditions, really no, no problems other than, um, uh, again, you look at uh, some issues in North Carolina uh, that are showing up on, on this chart. And uh, these numbers will come out again, uh, be renewed on Monday. So what we talked about last time uh, really hasn't changed much in terms of acreage. I know that that was a, that our big issue last time, wondering where things were going. Well, uh, in two weeks, we'll find out uh, at least what the USDA numbers are in that acreage report. Uh, as of right now, uh, still wondering about uh, the increase from 2019 to 20 in planted acres. I think what happened, Kyle, uh, um, Reese, others on here, no doubt, uh, Guy, is that uh, in such an uncertain environment, farmers looked around and, and, and saw almost no good options other than in Kansas, probably grain sorghum. I did hear of, in our area of, of some acreage, of a fair amount of grain sorghum acreage coming in, but that's, is that, is that 40 million acres? or 40,000 acres or 250,000. Uh, still, it's, it's not a big deal in the macro feed grain market. <clears throat> but uh, um, I, my, my guesstimate would be, well, you see, there's what I think. I, I think we'll end up closer to 95.5. And if I'm wrong, I'd like you all to conveniently just sort of delete this slide off of that presentation. But, but anyway, it, it does seem that that uh, through a combination of issues, low prices, and now some prevented planting problems, uh, that the 97 will probably be scaled down some. But, if, but uh, there's no USDA representatives on, on this call, are there? Uh, direct employees of NAS? I'm, I'm just checking, Kyle, just to make sure. Uh, point is that, that they've been really reticent to, to make changes in their numbers. That's been their pattern of late. When they come out with one number, man, it, it's almost, I mean, I, I, you look at all the last one or two years when they start with a the number, they have to have evidence upon evidence upon evidence to, to make a change. So uh, if, if you're, the, the surprise would be is if they made, made, made a major change and, and, and uh, if, if anything, they've, they've been waiting for one or two stocks reports to, to verify that, yeah, maybe we should change that initial number. So but my thought is that they're they're they just they're displaying a lot of reticence to to make many adjustments off of what they have, and I know our time's tied here. There, there was a I'll just go quickly with what we've got. Corn yields they did move down last year's uh, uh, yield estimate uh, down from one sixty seven point eight down to one sixty seven point four, but so you wonder well, what where are the yields going this year? That that projection the sixteen billion bushel crop is based on 178.5 bushels per acre and we have never been there. We have never been that high. We've been up to 176.6 so that is 1.9 billion, 1.9 bushels per acre higher than we've ever had and at 89 million acres planted uh, uh, I think by the time you if, if you scale that back, say it's 80, 88 even, I think 88 times two bushels per acre, 88 million acres times that about 170, 160 million bushels uh, too high. Uh, you, you have to really get crunched down to one to 170 or, or, or lower to have a, you know, to get to get down to, to the actually the, the amount of production we had even this year. So unless a drought comes in and unless the drought comes in, the La Nina comes full bloom and hits us in the U US uh, and blocking high pressure systems, uh, it, it looks like uh, we're in for at least moderate, moderate to large crops and uh, moderate to low prices. But uh, that said, uh, National Oceanic uh, 
whether um, a group in, uh, uh, in the U.S. has talked about how uh, the chances of, of, a, uh, of a late season La Nina drought from August on about 50%, which means flip a coin, which is, boy, that, that's a bold projection, it's 50%. Well, so th there is some greater risk than normal of a 50%, 50 uh, of a drought, and, and uh, that's across the whole U.S. If you talk to people in, in Kansas right now uh, that, who, are, who are experiencing drought creeping in from in the western part of the state and moving, moving to the east, they, they would, uh, they dispute that. They think that's pretty low. But, but overall, macro, a, a, in aggregate, uh, uh, more of a chance of, of drought this year than, than not, but, but coming in late. And uh, corn production, there, there's the almost 16 billion bushel corn number for 2020-21, uh, 18 billion bushel supplies, uh, again, it just really pretty much overwhelming things and having ending stocks at the end of all this of uh, you know you can see the ending stocks number 3.3 billion we've been to 2.3 before and <clears throat> times the past we've been pretty high but so it, it's it's a year projected to have uh, more than abundant stocks and low prices so as far as as far as the uh, export markets that you're looking at uh, nobody's anticipating any any lack of corn right now, one way or the other. Uh, just want to just do a quick drive by on on the what's happening in ethanol. Uh, at least the stabilization of prices dropping for for gasoline and diesel fuel. Uh, ethanol plant production recovering some, not up to where it was uh, before COVID nineteen shutdowns hit, but recovering and coming into the travel season. Uh, interestingly. When, when you saw um, plant production drop off, stocks dropped, and that's, that's a great sign. It uh, should be helpful to the, uh, to the, um, to the uh, overall supply and demand balance in the ethanol market. And you can see here, uh, one, one gauge of health in the ethanol market is how much are they bidding for corn? And uh, in, in Kansas, other places, you've got, if you look at, Basis bids on the top end side, they've got, they're pretty positive. So uh, things aren't dead in the water on the ethanol side. They're still trying to buy corn and still being aggressive. And you can see uh, ethanol prices from where they dropped to 70 cents a gallon in Iowa have come back now to a little over a dollar, not up to where they were, but, but uh, basically a welcome recovery. <clears throat> and this is probably the most relevant slide for you folks. Uh, and no doubt you do this on your own too, uh, but you can see that the pace of corn exports is tracking really pretty close to 2015-16. In essence, uh, gaining uh, after a slow start, when, when I look at this chart and, and look at the, the percent of gain, we're, we're moving at a pace about equal to where we were after, af and we had to get through a real slow time to about the 23rd, 24th week of the marketing year. But after that, Arguably, we're moving along at the same pace as we have otherwise, but but the slow start is is the issue. And, and you know, you're well aware we've had some 50 million bushel weeks here of late, 40, 46, 50, and um, that's all for the good. Um, I would say for uh, corn stocks to use, uh, you know, we're we're out here in 12 percent plus corn stocks to use territory where prices aren't very reactive. You have to get below that to where any elasticities really start to make us jumpy on the price side. But, but with what the USDA put out, there you go. Uh, you've got, we've, we've jumped out, we've jumped out to 22 some percent stocks to use. And, and um, I've spent a good amount of time, what I've talked about, trying to, trying to knock that down, <laughs> saying, gosh, high yields, probably too high acres. Uh, this to me looks like uh, uh, too high of a number, uh, given given what we're seeing now in, in the field. But but by too high, then do we get down below 20? Do we get to 19 or 18? Still, e even if we do that, we're still in this zone of of more than abundant supplies and relatively low prices. On the world corn supply demand side, guy, if I, if you've already touched on this, just tell me. But this is kind of a macro uh, view of world production, world uh, usage. 
<clears throat> and uh, and in this is that 16 billion bushel U.S. corn crop. So to the degree we knock that down, then then this is too pessimistic in terms of where things are going. But I, I guess that's what the next from from now to September October will tell us. And uh, um, you've seen this. Uh, this this is the world corn production numbers. Uh, guy, I think you've already touched on this probably, probably discussed uh, first and second season corn development in, in Brazil, big issue for us, and uh, their concerns in the south, uh, really looking pretty decent in the north, that second crop, and again, the second crop one's the one that's mainly exported. Uh, again, the USDA in their, in their uh, WASDE report spent a lot of time talking about this, and uh, you can see their, their discussion of where they're at, and uh, <clears throat> so I look at this number, I see the 2020-21 forecast, knowing that the U.S. corn, 16 billion bushel corn crop is in that, to me, it's, it's uh, too pessimistic. And we, you know, give, us, give us three, four months, and we'll have, the, we'll have the true number. Right now, this is just shooting an arrow on a line out into the future and, and uh, showing that, gosh, we're just a washing corn. And... Uh, it is interesting to look at the world less China, and you know China has been doing some things of late, uh, and you know again this. So, so um, if you if you don't take China out of the number with their big stocks, then that 2021 figure is way out to the right on that chart. You take China out of it, and um, uh, you uh, you know everyone everyone but China, and we still have a lot of corn, but it's not quite as dire of a situation. And stocks use closer to 15, you know, again, 15.7, uh, 15.8. And I re recall that some of your folks that, that are in that area have a, have a lot of insight and experience on where all that's going. Okay, I want to hit just a couple things on sorghum. Of course, in Kansas, we're, we're really fired up for, for sorghum and uh, farmers are planting it right and left. Uh, what you see on the supply demand balance sheet is that uh, Food seed industrial usage is going down, exports going up. <laughs> That's about what it is. And uh, this crop's getting planted. I don't think there are any major problems that we're having so far. Uh, likely to see acreage increase in the U.S. A lot of that coming from, you know, uh, again, Kansas, maybe Oklahoma, maybe Texas. <clears throat> and uh, uh, here's the supply demand, the usage by category, and um, again, Food seed industrial usage, mainly ethanol, going moving lower for sure. Uh, uh, pronounced increase in exports. The USDA is projecting still the glory years, 2014 and 15. Uh, we're not up to 300 million bushels yet. But again, that was a that was a China story. Uh, exports. Take note that you know if you're just looking at the rate of late, uh, pretty good rate. Of, of growth for grain sorghum exports out of the U.S. And uh, uh, you see the corn stocks use going strong, the, the, the uh, grain sorghum stocks use to seven, down to 7%. So export demand pulling, tightening up, uh, tightening up that, that situation and uh, there you go. <laughs> and uh, kind of a world coarse grain usage uh, viewpoint uh, again, you still have that corn corn crop in there, but uh, you know it doesn't. It's interesting to look at the world coarse uh, coarse grain supply demand and to see where that's at. And uh, again, not quite as dire as as for corn by itself. There's, we have barley, we have oats involved in that. We have feed grain instead of it's not grown. Uh, when you're when you're scrambling at the end, that's what the that, that's that's supposed to be an I instead of an, an, an I. well, the, we'll just move on. So here, here you got, so what's coming up? Um, we have um, uh, the June 30th acreage grain stocks reports. Uh, the, uh, the possibility if, of moving the corn market some if, if there's an acreage surpri surprise to the downside on the stocks number, if I, I, I think what we're watching there is, is will be it, in essence how feed usage held up in the midst of all the coronavirus impacts on the livestock industry. 
July 1, there's some, some reports coming out, but again, our, our big dates moving on from there will be uh, uh, the July 10th uh, WASD report, the crop production number, they're really not, they're not measuring corn production yet or grain sorghum production. Even in August, we have, we'll have a crop production report. There'll, there'll be surveys, but not uh, of farmers, but not in the field measures. So the, even that's kind of mitigated in terms of its supply demand impact. Really, we, uh, and Guy, if I, unless I'm seeing this wrong or any of the rest of you, the big issue will be the September report because that's the first time the USDA will be out in the field unless they change uh, in the field measuring crops themselves off of their, uh, measuring these summer planted crops th themselves. So, and the WASDA reports will be important in those time, in those dates for sure, but uh, but uh, that's September, September 11th, <laughs> September 11th will be uh, the next USDA report that'll have all this data coming together and that's probably the time of the uh, most potential volatility for us. Okay. So, um, thanks for hearing me out. Are there any questions I can try to address? Together with Guy. Okay, let's see here. I'll get over to uh, take a look at the... Um, yeah. yeah, this is, this is Reese. Yeah, Reese. Yeah, I, I know you talked about the USDA and, you know, they kind of stick with one number. You know, what, what do you think it would take for them to, to you know, strongly revise this number uh, going into June? You know, what are your outlooks going into June 30th report? And then also for the rest of the year, I mean, what, what is it going to take for them to move some of these numbers? I mean, we saw them move yield only 0.4 bushels per acre this past report. And I think that's them gradually stepping down from last year, trying to lower that crop gradually. But you know, this year, I think there's a lot of talk about how we're not even close to 97 million acres. Like you said, you were uh, quite a bit below that in the 95 in change camp. Um, any comments on what it would take for the USDA to make a drastic decision? Well, Reese, I'm becoming more of a politician in my old age. Uh, uh, so um, I, there's a couple, there's two, two things that, that we've been looking for. Uh, to verify and and, uh, and one, well, the main one would be if there's a major change uh, in, in acres, uh, you know, the evidence would be found in, in seed sales. I have not heard from market chatter, market talk, that the type of, of information you'd be hearing on, on that if, uh, if, if, if we were having a big switch in acres, then, then people would, farmers would be turning back seed. I have not heard that discussion. You know, I've been listening for it. Uh, uh, Arlen Suderman, you know, well-respected, uh, former, had, had a time in Kansas Extension, uh, arguably, a, uh, I think FC Stone, arguably as good as there is in terms of market analysts, was listening to, to uh, some of his discussion and, and uh, his thoughts were at, at, uh, er, earlier on that, that it makes sense with all the, with all the economic um, uh, news that was happening and all the all the fear about corn demand that man we we we'd be cutting corn acres and heading head for something else probably soybeans or whatever or sorghum in places but but uh, didn't have a lot of talk of this so we started digging around to you know well what what's the what's the real safety net that they that that farmers have. Uh, that you know, if 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 they if they are trusting that the market will hold up, then what what then they have to be looking at USDA price coverage uh, through crop insurance, after 388 corn, uh, 388 uh, planning price for revenue coverage, or the revenue protection figure on the backside of 370 per bushel, uh, and and and. But, in, but those numbers are only for percentages. We take 70% crop insurance off the, and, or 75% and then take, and really your net effective price over all acres, not just, but your cover for insurance is, it's 0 0.7 times 388. And you know, for your pre-harvest futures coverage, and that gets you like to 291. If it's 70% if it's, uh, APH, if it's 75%, it's like 310, something like that. 
So, um, uh, and, and you know what, it is amazing how that is not far off the USDA's number 320. <laughs> and, and the 370, they, they pay that for only 85% of the production. Take, take that back, you back that off, and again, you're around $3. Uh, so, so what were they really thinking? Uh, far, farmers saw those numbers, if they, and they're astute, as you, you all well know, and, and they, they're probably, if, they're far, if they decided to farm the safety net, they were the USDA put the price. So what would it take for the USDA to show that? Well, it would take, it would take evidence. And, and the, the trust on our, Lord help me, the trust on our part that if they have that evidence, they're gonna show it first of all, and not, and not, just, and not just take a, a risk averse approach and say, well, let's see what further evidence shows. They've been, to, to some degree, they've been, uh, they've been, uh, uh, it wouldn't be the first time of late where they've, they've want, they want verifying evidence from further reports before they show the full impact of what they see. But um, that, that, sound, that sounds like I'm, like I'm, I'm really, really uh, beating on my good friend Lance Honig. <laughs> I know Lance, he's a good guy. Uh, but, but, but I, I, you know, their, their evidence, their pattern of late has been to pre, be pretty cautious to make, to make major changes in. So the changes have tended to come later rather than, rather than early. Reese, that's my thought. I'd, I'd invite your comments. Am I, am I too pessimistic in, in viewing that and, and uh, too hard on the USDA folks? No, I think I'm equally pessimistic to be honest, Dan. Um, you know, I, I it, you know, I always just wonder at what cost are they, are they doing this uh, to the grower? I mean, that's that's just one of the things I think about often. You know, I think this past year, they've gotten some payments and have been able to stay afloat via various payments over the past couple of years. But, um, you know, keeping corn prices depressed with these inflated balance sheets that I think are slightly artificially inflated, maybe the trade does too, um, probably not the best thing for the grower long term. It, it, it took until the September report to September uh, 2019 report for them to have enough evidence to make to, to scale back the uh, 2018 soybean crop by 80 million bushels. And my understanding is they had evidence that the corn 2018 corn crop was also over overbid was was too high, but they waited you know, they waited until later on again to get to, to not September, but till the basically the the uh, January acreage number to come back in and scale the core number down. Even though they think they thought they had it, but they waited. So there's a there's a there's a pattern here of late, and and maybe they'll prove. I I hope I hope I'm wrong, and they'll prove me a liar. But there there's a pattern of waiting until they have confirming evidence from stocks reports where they can back calculate on these on their numbers and figure out oh yeah that we, we we've got to change that but in in but at, at what cost uh, at, it it tends to it, at least the way this has been falling it has tended to 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 uh, present the market supply demand balance sheets in a way that have that have been uh, been inhibiting of price So if you guys take that and report that to to uh, Bill Chambers, uh, who I know at the World Ag Board, he'll probably get a committee up and and uh, and uh, they'll contact the president of Kansas State University and say, "What's that guy saying?" <laughs> but but that's that's what we're observing implicitly in how they're handling these numbers. Do we have any other questions for for Guy or Dan? All right, well, so you, can, you can always drop me an email if you want to make a point or discuss things. So appreciate Anna's point. Appreciate Carrie's comments on the inside into Thailand on the barley. And, and uh, yeah, a bit of a dialogue is always appreciated. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if there's no other questions, um, 
thank you to, to Guy and Dan for your, your time today. It was uh, very informative, a lot of good information uh, flowing out of, out of Kansas State from you too. Um, so we, we do appreciate you taking the time to, to share your, your thoughts on, on the WASD and, and just the, the markets and, and um, where they're heading, what they're doing. Um, again, if you have any follow-up questions that you think of afterwards, feel free to email Guy or Dan, um, or you can send them to me and I can get them to, to either of them, uh, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer them. Um, so with that, thank you all for, for joining. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to help out.